Hi there, this video is about another recent home improvement project. We had a couple of storms lately and lost mains power a few times, so I thought to add an emergency light in the downstairs hallway, so at least the stairs are well lit. I looked at many options, but in the end I decided on this Robus 4 watt light. It has a built-in battery allowing at least 3 hours of operation when the power fails. I got this light from Screwfix, a chain of UK hardware stores, for £28. It comes with a usual pack of mounting material. The body is rather reflective, so let me step down the exposure a little. Ok, that's better. There are reasonably well written multi language instructions. The light itself looks just like a normal bulkhead type, and nothing is giving away the fact that this has built in emergency power. Loosening of two screws allows the top cover to be removed. The screws are captive, so they won't fall out if this light is mounted on the ceiling. A string of 12 LEDs all wired in parallel. The two solder spots in the center show where the power to the LEDs is coming from the inside. There's also a green LED just visible through a hole in the lower right. There's the single screw that needs to be removed. This is kind of a transport lock and doesn't need to be reinstalled. Once it is removed, the front panel can be unclipped on the top and it pops out because it is spring loaded. The panel opens on a hinge like a door to allow installing or servicing the battery. Again, this comes in handy when the light is mounted on the ceiling. There is the circuit board and of course the battery. The battery cable is disconnected. Obviously, this was done by the manufacturer to ensure it doesn't get discharged accidentally. Before plugging it in, a closer look at the battery. It's a nickel cadmium 3 cell battery for 3.6 volts, 1.6 amp hours manufactured in May 2019, so about 6 months ago. Its model number is 3-KRH23-3-43. I deliberately choose this light because I wanted an emergency light with a nickel cadmium battery instead of for example a lithium ion battery. You see, nickel cadmium batteries are far better suited for emergency lights than most other battery technologies because they can be kept top up with a low permanent charge current which is a very reliable and simple method. Lead acid batteries for a ceiling mounted emergency light would need to be sealed to avoid spilling acid and be of the deep cycle or maritime variant to, su to survive the occasional deep discharge during power outages. The charger needs to be relatively smart to charge the battery normal and then switch to float charging keeping a constant voltage. Nickel metal hydrate has real problems with being slow charged and you definitely should not run the charge current permanently. An option might be a smart charger that turns the charge current off after the battery is fully charged and many days later does a small top up charge for an hour or so to compensate for the self discharge of the battery. I have yet to find an emergency light that does this kind of charging. All they do is use a permanent charge current that will inevitably cause problems. The same is true with many emergency lights from China using lithium batteries. There are many reports that these lights don't last long and get hot. The additional problem for lithium cells is that they degrade if they are stored at fully charged for extended periods. So their use in emergency light is really questionable. 
I could not find any suitable emergency light with a lead acid battery, so I decided to go with the old fashioned nickel cadmium. Despite that nickel cadmium batteries have disappeared from shops and supermarket shelves. This is because the sale of consumer nickel cadmium batteries has been banned within the European Union except for medical use, alarm systems and emergency lighting. The reason is of course the cadmium content and the fact that most people just threw the batteries away instead of bringing them to a recycling point. Of course I will recycle mine when the time comes. Besides the battery chemistry, there is something odd about the battery data. This one here delivers 3.6 volts and has a capacity of 1.6 amp hours. Yet the light is supposed to stay on for at least 3 hours. How does this work with a 4 watt LED light? 1.6 amp hours means we can get 1.6 amps for 1 hour or 0.53 amps for 3 hours. At 3.6 volts and 0.53 amps, the battery can at best deliver 1.9 watts. Maybe they mean 4 watts when mains is available and less when on battery. Let's find out. The first thing is to measure the voltage at the LEDs while running from mains. The light is so bright, making it hard for me to see where to probe, so I use the installation instructions to partly shield the light. 2.762 volts. As this is the forward voltage of the LEDs, it stays the same whether on battery or on mains. I use a clamp meter to check the current to the LEDs while running from mains. 0.49 milliamps. And when I turn off mains so the fully charged battery takes over, 0.325 milliamps. So the LEDs are using only 1.38 watts when on mains and just 0.92 watts on battery. Nowhere near the claimed 4 watts. Well, if you read the text carefully, it is clear they only say that it uses only 4 watts of power, not that the light is 4 watt. Very sneaky. And indeed, the real power consumption with the light on and the battery trickle charging is at 4.39 watts, just a little higher than the claimed 4 watts. However, the power factor is about 0.52. This means the apparent power is double that at 8.3 volt amperes. I discussed this topic and the implications if you are on a smart meter in a previous video, which I link in the description below. By the way, this emergency light can be used in maintained or non-maintained mode. Maintained means that the light is either permanently on or can be turned on or off like a normal light while mains power is on. Maintained mode is what I use for this measurement. Non-maintained mode means the light comes only on when the mains power failed and goes off when the power comes back. This is what I used here and the real power is now 1.71 watts and the power factor 1. Great! Not so fast. See that the current is 0? This is a limit of this power meter. It doesn't display a reliable current and power factor if the current is lower than around 20 milliamps. Putting the trusty BM235 meter in series with the mains to measure the current shows we are drawing 16 milliamps. This means the apparent power is 3.8 volt ampere and the power factor should be 0.44. The power meter is really more geared towards loads that use at least 2 to 3 watts real power. From almost empty, the battery charge current is around 130 milliamps. If this would remain constant, the battery would be fully charged in 24 hours, but it will take slightly longer as the current drops while the battery voltage increases. But to my surprise, the current drops only very little. The battery is now fully charged and the current going into the battery is still 120 milliamps. This is pretty high for going into a battery day in and out for two or more years. It is just within what is allowed as a permanent charge current for this type of battery. Since the battery is now fully charged, I decided to see how long it would last when powering the LEDs. Here you see the battery voltage 4 hours and 40 minutes in 
at 3.57 volts, still almost nominal voltage. The LEDs are still brightly lit. And at the same time, the battery discharge current was 257 milliamps. Six hours in, the battery has dropped to 3.35 volts, which means each cell is now slightly above 1.1 volt, and we are rapidly approaching the recommended cutoff voltage for nickel cadmium cells. And the current has dropped by around 50 milliamps to 200 milliamps. I can't really notice much difference in the brightness of the LEDs. Another 30 minutes later, the voltage has dropped to 3.17 volts, which means 1.05 volts per cell, and you can see that the voltage is dropping much faster now. And the current has dropped another 50 milliamps to 154 milliamps. This means the current is also dropping faster. Seven hours in, and we are now at 2.88 volts, that means 0.96 volts per cell. The LEDs are much dimmer, and while setting up for videoing the current, the shutdown happened, and so unfortunately I missed recording the final minute. What happened is that the battery is discharged into the LEDs with ever reducing current and hence reduced brightness until the battery voltage drops just below the LED forward voltage of 2.762 volts. At that moment the LEDs go off and the current drops to zero. The battery voltage then recovers somewhat, but some logic on the PCB prevents the battery from reconnecting to the LEDs again until the mains voltage has come back. Using the LED forward voltage to signal the end of the discharge is a neat trick to be sure, but I'm a little concerned about the deep discharge. A cutoff of 2.762 volts means each cell is discharged to about 0.92 volts, which is still within the battery specs, but definitely very much on the low side. Let's park that for a moment and have a closer look at the PCB, which can be easily unclipped from the enclosure. It certainly looks tidy, apart from the weirdly sloping chip. On the right is the big mains connector, and on the left you can see the green LED and the two connectors for battery and LEDs. Here you see the sloping IC a little closer. It's an AP8012 and a typical controller with integrated MOSFET for a switch mode power supply. Next we have the big mains terminal block. There are four connections, N for neutral, the PL connection is for permanent live, while SL is for switched live. If SL is connected to live, the light turns on when mains is available. The unlabeled connection between N and PL is for earth. The two live inputs are separately protected by these fuses. Next to the transformer we have not one but two optocouplers, which is a bit unusual. Also we have two big rectifier diodes and two big capacitors instead the usual one of each. The rest of the board looks deceptively empty. There are just two transistors and the sockets for the battery and LEDs. And another fuse, this time for the battery. The bulk of the components are on the underside. It turns out to be quite a complex analog circuit, all done with discrete components. In the low voltage part I counted no less than six transistors and seven diodes. Separation between the high voltage and low voltage part is excellent. The switch mode power supply in the high voltage part looks well put together. The big black component is of course the full bridge rectifier as Electro Boom would say. I did some reverse engineering of the PCB and without going too deep into details, this is what we've got. On the left we have the high voltage part, as you may have already suspected from the two big diodes and capacitors, the transformer is actually feeding two separate power circuits. One is dedicated to the battery charging and the other one to the LEDs if you decide to run them from mains. The AP8012 chip takes only one voltage control feedback input and in this circuit the voltage for the battery charge circuit is regulated using the usual circuit of Zener diode and one of the optocouplers. The LED 
powered circuit has no regulation. As a consequence, if the LEDs are on and you unplug the battery, the chip reduces its switching frequency to keep the now idle battery charge circuit at 5.8 volts which results in the LED brightness dropping dramatically. So you can't really use this light without a battery plugged in. The mystery of the second optocoupler is revealed to be the input to allow the lights to be turned on and off while the mains is available. You can see that this optocoupler is reversed. The SL input is rectified and smoothed and used to drive the LED in the optocoupler. The smoothing has the interesting effect that switching the light off through the SL input is noticeably delayed by the second or so it takes for the capacitor to discharge sufficiently for the LED to turn off. Regarding the details of the battery charge circuit, I looked if it could be easily modified to reduce the trickle charge current somewhat and raise the cutoff voltage as this would need some experimentation and therefore repeatedly replacing SMD components, I decided to try another path and go for the battery connector instead. This is what I came up with. Putting a 10 ohm resistor into the line to the battery reduces the trickle charge current from 120 milliamps to around 80 milliamps. The 80 milliamp value is a bit of a compromise. If I go lower than about 60 milliamps, then the green charge LED indicator will go out and of course the recovery after a power failure will be taking much longer. But of course the 10 ohm resistor is unacceptable when it comes to powering the LEDs from the battery in an event of a power failure. That's why this diode effectively short circuits the resistor if the current flows from the battery to the LEDs. For this to work without causing too much of a drop in current, this needs to be a short key diode with very low forward voltage drop. Besides shorting the resistor during discharge, the very small but still present voltage drop over the diode raises the cutoff voltage to the battery by the same amount. Best of all, with a matching JST socket and plug. On either end, this circuit can be put built as an extension cable to the battery and easily inserted and removed without any modification to the PCB. This will be useful when it comes to replace the battery pack with a new one which may need additional tweaking. In this shot for my testing phase, the modification is still made by a flying lead circuit. The BM235 measures the trickle current to the fully charged battery which is, as expected, now 80 milliamps instead of 120 milliamps. When simulating a power failure, the current direction now reverses and the LED panel is driven through the Schottky diode with around 320 milliamps, which is a bit lower but close enough to what it was before the mod. Since the discharge took many hours, I switched to bench multimeters. The current is measured by the Solatron 750+. The 3441A is in remote control mode, measuring and recording the voltage every 10 seconds. What you see here is the final moments in time-lapse. The final voltage is 3.07 volts, which means a cutoff at 1.02 volts per cell. I am much more comfortable with that. When I turn the power back on, the charge current starts at 130 milliamps as it did before, gradually reducing as the battery voltage rises. This is now more pronounced with the 10 ohm resistor in series and slightly extending the time to reach a fully charged state but our power failures are so rare that this hardly matters to me. I am more concerned to reduce the amount of trickle charge current. This is a plot of the recorded voltage data. If anything, it appears running the light at a slightly reduced current and a raised cut-off voltage due to the Schottky diode 
has unexpectedly extended the time it stays lit by about an hour to eight hours and a half. I am happy with that result. Time to finalize that modification. I clued a JST socket onto a base made by two wooden coffee steerers cut in half and glued together. This gives the whole thing some mechanical stability. The wires leading to a JST connector are epoxied with a strain relief in form of a cable tie to the other end of the base. In between you can make out the 10 ohm resistor and the Schottgate diode protected from shorting against the negative terminal with some transparent heat shrink. In fact, I will cover the whole thing in heat shrink in a moment. Like this, just the socket on one end and the cable with a connector on the other end are exposed. I secured the whole thing to the battery using rubber bands. You can see how the wired end of my mod plugs into the PCB while the battery now plugs into the socket on my modification. Does it have any effect on the electricity bill? Yes it does. When the battery is full, the real power is now just 1.35 watts from previously 1.7 watts and the current has dropped to 14 milliamps instead of 16 milliamps. If you are only charged for real power, that's a difference of 40p per year, £1.74 instead of £2.14. But besides these relative modest savings, I hope the much gentler treatment of the battery will prolong its guaranteed 2 year life by hopefully a couple of additional years. The instructions for the light actually tell you to do a short functional test every month and a test to see if the battery can power the light for at least 3 hours every year. There is even a table in the instructions to record your tests. Apparently they expect you to trip the circuit breaker or have a switch somewhere to disconnect the emergency lights from the mains for testing. Well, this is a residential property and I can't just trip the circuit breaker because there's other stuff hanging on it. So as the last modification to this light, I added a test button to disrupt its mains power just for testing the emergency light function. The rear of the push button is the black thing you see in the back of the housing. To wire it in, I also added an additional terminal block. The button is of the latching type to allow running the 3 hour test without having to press the button for 3 hours. This is how this modification looks from the outside. Of course the lid of the light is still missing. And this is the button in action. All these tests, plenty of charge and discharge cycles while experimenting with modifications took the better part of 4 weeks, so it is with some relief that I finally installed this light today. Apologies for the grainy image and I hope this journey into the world of emergency lights was of interest. Thanks for watching.